So what was this chapter about? Um, it's been a while since I read it. Um... Yeah, same. Prediction, invasion, inference. The data model combines a form of posterior distribution, which we settle or we summarize by a set of simulations of the parameters, and we propagate uncertainty via simulation-based predictions. And finally, we include additional information in the model using a prior. So that just is the first uh, paragraph anyway. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, did you just to be uh, summarized by itself? So, uh, <clears throat> so let's have, a, let's have a think here. So basically it's about setting the posterior distribution, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is taking the uh, parameters of a model and then, um, and then re, uh, resampling um, a, a data set based upon that, based upon those parameters. Uh -huh. Get producers for unobserved and future outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> so it's had about adding and says to the model. Right, okay. So uh, later, <clears throat> let's look. So, what's the first section? Propagating uncertainty in inference using posterior simulations. So, they're using the Hibbs data set. That's the one where it basically says economic growth affects um, the percentage of the popular vote. Um, and here what they do is add the data, then they set this, then the seed, and then the file, which I presume is that what they're doing is adding in, um, they're adding in this old model here, mm -hmm. which is pr giving the, well, well, they print out here, which is giving the uh, the information about this previous model that was calculated um, directly, uh, so you can access directly the posterior samples. So these are posterior samples of the of the previous of the previous model. Can't remember how we made that model exactly. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm looking back. They're saying seven one. They just use the stand GLM function, basically. So they've got some kind of uh, default priors, and and they use those. Okay. We oh yeah. Yeah, we didn't use any kind of special, you know, intelligence based priors. Just yeah, the priors that come with the model. Okay. Uh, we have to keep the meat. Oh yeah, then they're hand computing the median and the uh, the uh, median absolute uh, deviation. They're using blah blah. I don't really understand what this is going on about at this point in time. So, I see a scaled. Summarize uncertainty. Oh god, it's so long. Um. Oh, hang on a minute. That's 9.1. It's not done in the graphs in this. Oh, they're down here. Interesting. Because right. th that kind of explains from this. So, oh, here we are. Sorry. Yeah. Uncertainty in the regression coefficients. So basically, it's about modeling the uncertainty in the regression coefficients. Mm -hmm. So it takes the, uh, the mean values, uh, so the uh, measure of central tendency, and then captures this fixed fix effect mm -hmm. of the model. Oh, so it's to capturing fixed effect uh, one and fixed effect two of the model, presumably. So if we go back up there, that'll be the um, will be the growth point. Mm. These two, yeah, growth and yeah. Anyway, um, so it captures those two. And then, so that's the uh, standard error for, oh, oh, right. So that is the intercept. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Okay, oh, so that's, August? Yeah. Um, Federica asked if you were sharing the screen. I, I don't see it. There you go. Good. Oh, cool. sorry. Yeah. No, no worries. That's good. 
Oh yeah, sorry. I was I was just trying to work out what it was doing. So um, here's the original um, uh, model at the top here, which they've captured from the previous one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then I've got the posterior samples that are shown below that are come from that model. Um, presumably, that must have been uh, they must have measured must have measured uncertainty in that previous one in order to get those posterior samples. So that must have been iterated in some respects. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so then when we go down to here, we're pulling out the, uh, the median intercept and the median, uh, growth, uh, for those, uh, for those posteriors, presumably. Yeah. Cause it says post B. Yeah. And then what we're doing is capturing the standard area error around those two, um, those two effects. And they make two plots that kind of show how that how the error is distributed, well as how the, the distribution around those effects in order to show the uncertainty within the uh, within the effects that have been modeled. And that's essentially what these two things show here. Um, posterior simulation of the intercept A and posterior of the beta. Pretty straightforward. Um, and the this is posterior drawn draws of the regression coefficients a and b so this is um showing this ellipsis here is basically showing the relationship between alpha and beta um which is what we'd kind of expect isn't it mm -hmm. yeah but, yeah but, because if you remember what when we were talking before about the maximum likelihood, right, right, and it falls right in the center between two of them, so you can see that the density is highest right in the middle, mm -hmm. and then you've got like this kind of like spread at either side. Okay, this is an interesting plot. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then this is the well, if you create loads of uh, lines of best fit this is what happens with the different uh, variations upon that. So all, all that they're really showing here is the uncertainty in the different, in the different elements of the regression. Mm -hmm. And that we've created those by doing a, um, uh, by doing a, a Bayesian regression. Um, uh, using the matrix of posterior simulations to express uncertainty about parameter estimates function. So is this here, um, so what is this here doing? So this is just capturing the uncertainty in, why is it Z and B? Oh, because you'd have um, the intercept anyway, and you're mm -hmm. dividing that by B mm. in order to get the Z value. Mm -hmm. Oh, for each of them, right, okay. Okay, so that so basically what that's telling us there is that it captures <coughs> the Z the Z the Z value. Um oh, sorry, the Z scores for each of for each of those um, for each of those models. Oh, um, August, sorry uh, to interrupt. Um, can you please refresh our memory where the uh, markdown is located? Oh yeah, um, it's uh, Kurtz. Uh, I have it somewhere, but I didn't have my notes handy. Oh yeah, here we go, Alex Kurtz. Alex Kurtzman, and then. Where is it? Uh, it's one of these in here. All the trees. Where is he? It should be regression of the stories. Uh, after DS. Dynamic. So this is what you're thinking. Is that what we're doing? No, wait. Oh, is it AS Kurtz working through regression and other? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. There we, there we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. I'll copy it to the chat. So we're all okay, at cool. yeah. 
Okay. Um, um, feel, feel free to jump in anyone uh, like you know I, I'm, I'm just reading this off the top of my head and also this um, this markdown which I haven't created so um, I, you know I can't remember everything that's happened because it's been about three weeks since I read it I think um, I'm not sure why um, Z score is for this is the uh, in, is the intercept divided by uh, growth in order to get the Z score for the model, but presumably that's how a Z score for a model is calculated. Um, mm -hmm. Presumably, if you had additional terms, you'd have to calculate the Z score for each term independently and they'd all be divided by the intercept. Um, is that reasonable to assume? I think so. Okay. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> I suppose we may as well move on to the prediction part. Um, unless anyone's got any other thoughts about it. Um, I think that first part is straightforward, reasonably straightforward. Um, so, um, yeah, so what, what the, the whole point of this section is, is that once you've got a fitted regression uh, with all the uncertainty, et cetera, or the error, uh, you can use it. Now. Sorry. Right. I, yeah, I guess, I guess it's just saying, since we have uh, the samples, um, if we want to learn something about some combination, then then we could could use them to get these kinds of, um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of values, median, bad, whatever, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so what's it say here? The BRM package includes predict, uh, posterior, lin predict, and posterior predict. Presumably, the lin is for linear. Uh, I'm not sure why there would be a different one for posterior predict. Um, I feel like so, there's some subtlety there, yes. Um, yeah. but, uh, um, compute best point estimate of the average value of y for two new data points. So that's just... So just new X then. Um, oh, so that's what it's all about here. All right, so um, based on the fitted model, it is uh, the best point estimate uh, of the average value of Y for a new data points with new value of X. So if we're given a new value of X, what's the, what's the value of Y essentially? Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the first thing you predict. But of course you're gonna want it with uncertainty. Um, compute the distribution of uncertainty about the expected or average value of y for new points. Um, uh, A and B. I don't really understand that part. This represents the distribution of this. I'm looking at yeah because the because the one includes the error term but then the other one does not the third one includes the error term predictive uncertainty yeah so they're saying posterior lin pred is the uncertainty in the value of the fitted regression line and then we could construct a vector representing predictive uncertainty in a single election. Oh, I see. So, right. So, this is the estimate for the actual. This is like the point estimate for the value of y. Right. This so is the actually... distribution of uncertainty over y, and then yeah. of the observations of y. Uh, I don't. Can't, I'm not really quite get sure about that last part. Right, and then in the book, as I'm looking at the book, so it's page one sixteen. Um, they're showing it by hand, so. I feel like the first two are pretty clear what they are. Um, yeah, and then the third, he's actually simulating the error. So he's got R norm for the number of sims and then the sigma. So they're including the uncertainty due to the error, due to the sigma beyond just, you know, the uncertainty you would get from your predictions. Yeah. 
So that's what's going on there, I, I suppose. Okay. Well, Shall we work through the example? Because that might actually help. So let's do what, that. Yeah, that would be yeah. good. Okay. Uh, I didn't. I didn't realize they went through them afterwards. Um, so. Oh, he's doing it right there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. say we want to use our M seven point one model to predict uh, an incumbent's vote share conditional on two percent economic growth. If we would like a single point prediction, we can use uh, BRMS predict. A key point is that is that we'll need to feed our new growth value in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, we grow value by the way of the data, which we'll call new. The data is then fed into the new data argument, and uh, we want to uh, want the point summarized by the posterior median rather than the posterior mean. We set this to robust. What's robust mean? What happens? What happens if you don't use robust? I guess you would get the the mean instead of the median. Right. Okay. Okay, so uh, so they so they predict so they use the same model from the last one. They predict that the new data is growth, so that's two. Uh, so growth equals two um, because that's an x value for this regression rather than the y. So that should give us a y value, which is the estimate. Then becomes well, if there's growth of two, then the estimate is fifty-two point three five with. Uh, that amount of error, well, four points of error, it's quite sizable, to be honest. And that's typical, the RMS accompanies the point estimate with special, with measures of spread. If you want to use the posterior medians of uh, alpha and beta parameters to do this by hand, it would probably be easy, easiest to extract these using the fixed effects uh, function. Um, which can be useful if you're uh, trying to um, do things like imputation mm -hmm. um, using a linear transformation, um, by the way. Uh, mm. So, but that uh, gets exactly the same result. Well, or almost exactly the same result. It's 0.4 out, roughly. So basically what they're saying is, this is the first part. So why why would we do all of this? So the first part is to predict the point estimate. So the point estimate is what 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 value do we think that we would achieve by getting it, adding new information to the model? Um, the linear predictor with uncertainty is so we're doing basically the same thing again. Um, why then? So new data in again. That's true. Um, okay. Ah, but in this case, what we've got is a number of different values instead. Mm -hmm. Why do we have a number of values? Uh, why then predict? Is it because that's just so this one's just a point? When we use predict, we just get a point estimate. But when yeah. we use while in predict, we get the uncertainty around the point. That we get the additional values um, based yeah. on the posterior. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, and then you can use those values then cr to create the uncertainty. Presumably that's what this part is, so the posterior predict, kind of get the same values. Hmm. Uh, he's using a uh, normal distribution, uh, what's it, uh, R norm. Mm -hmm. And pull out these Y values. Not quite the same as those. Should have probably set seed there. Um, yeah, he should have done that, but no one. <laughs> <laughs> now we can visualize uh, the uncertainty around the y, the predicted y value, which is presumably what this is all about. So, mm -hmm. so these are just five values based on the same piece of information. Is that what that is? Times growth. It seems to be all that is. Yeah. Um, because we've only got one value in you. So in one of them, we just get one value. In the second one, we get um, several oh. different values because it's iterated uh, several, several times. And then in the third one, we're getting um, 
we're getting essentially the whole spread of the values and therefore we're able to visualize the number of uh, simulations that land with a prediction around well whatever number so these are all the predictions mm. process distribution and oh the slope um the slope is what you can think of as line of best fit or the model essentially um right so i think that covers basically how would you use it to predict to some extent there are some formulas um which go which come a bit later on about the linear prediction and the prediction values so we talk about those here mm -hmm. maybe it does um <clears throat> Anyway, this I suppose this could be quite useful as visualizing it, but essentially, but anyway, prediction given a range of input values, we can use the three functions to evaluate posterior predictions um, for a range of predictive values. First, we define a range of growth. All right, okay, so this is about say, well, what would happen if in different scenarios? So what we're doing is creating a uh, uh, several different values, as you can see here, from minus. Two to uh, to four, I suppose. Right. Um, in terms of growth, and then predicting what we would expect to happen in those different scenarios. So this is something that might be a bit more useful if you like looking at it more from, or if you were tweaking, <laughs> if you're able to tweak the economy. Um, I think good, most yeah. governments would like the recipe to that. <laughs> Um, anyway, so what they do is a point prediction, uh, they do the linear prediction, and then for then they do this grid, prediction grid, which, uh, which brings us back to the uncertainty, that, which is this bit up here. Anyway, um, then what are we doing here? So what, what's this showing us? Um, the first function predict returns a 13 by 4 numeric array uh, for each of the 13 growth values. And the columns are the typical blah, blah, blah. I wish I had seen that. Whereas the linear pred and the posterior pred return 4,000 by 13 numeric array with the columns marks off as 13 values of growth and 14,000 draws. So essentially what happened here was in these two, the because these are only, this is just the predictions of what we'd expect to get at Y, whereas these are trying to create the uncertainty around that. Yes. I'm not, still not quite sure if I understand what the difference is between these two functions. Um, the, the third one includes the error term, but the second one does not. It's like the third, so it's like the third one is adding noise to what you get just by, yeah, applying the function. Okay. Yeah. So that's why they end up with uh, with uh, much bigger ones. So they're basically the same in okay. some respects, but there's yeah, error terms yeah. more error, more error accounted for in this version. Yes. Um, right. Propagating uncertainty. If we want to propagate uncertainty in our predictors too, so far we haven't actually done that. Yeah. Uh, it's possibly easiest to do that by using the uh, by working with post itself which is is that the data um what is post yeah we might want to go back to where he grabs that at first mm. so put put post down here Post. Post is clearly posterior, but where does he build it? I'm wondering where does he draw that? Yeah. Nope, not yet. Oh, mm, no. Must be at the top. 
Um, let's so look. Probably one of the first. All right, right here we go. Let's so, uh, just grab posterior samples as the function. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so the posterior samples from the previous one. Here it's only shown 13. The, this must be a much bigger data frame. Right. Um, how, how, how many samples were used? Uh, what is it? 7.1 is, this, is it called? So yeah. Se- if we go and look at 7.1. Let's take a look. I think it just pulls 4,000. Let's see. I'm not seeing it, but I think it's just 4,000 it pulls. It must be. Um, I think we'd have to go back to the one where we created it in um, in his data. Um, I can probably see that here. The 7.1 here, there's Hibs, who created model 7.1 here. Um, Oh, he saved it in the background. Um, so saved in the background somewhere. Oh, mm, never mind. Um, <clears throat> anyway, basically the whole points, every, all the points are, there is an uncertainty in models, so there must be uncertainty in our predictions. So we create um, whilst we can initially just create our point estimate, we then need to create the uncertainty that is found in the uh, in the linear predictions, along with the uh, along with the posterior predictions. So that is what we're doing here in order to create these values. Um, linear prediction. So the line, the 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 linear prediction doesn't include the um, error in the beta coefficient, mm. which is the difference, as, um, as Steve said. Um, so then there's also some formulas as well, which we haven't really explained properly. Um, I'm not sure if it's worth explaining those. As do, we, do, do you think we need to go over them? Does he go over them? No. With, I'm sorry, which ones? Um, well, there's it shows the formulas for the oh, um, for the linear yeah. prediction for the prediction, um, but I'm not sure if it's if it's worth going over those or not because what it's showing is how you calculate those things in right. uh, notation. Although what they also say is the notation is overly simplified because it hmm. only really applies to these linear aspects. As soon as you start adding, I know that it, he writes this later on, but as soon as you start adding in like um, uh, degrees of freedom or uh, uh, polynomial functions mm. um it, it, apparently the maths gets really really hard and you can't really uh, hold on to it mm. um which is why computers were invented exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay um anyway so basically in order to create this uncertainty you have to create loads and loads of data and that is probably one of the downsides of the bayesian approach because even if we do have more computational power we still have to create lots and lots of data mm. um so in order, but we also need to propagate that uncertainty forward. Um, so we have our posterior distribution here, and what he's doing is picking out the growth. Uh, oh, he's creating a new column called growth, which is uh, using normal distribution draws with a mean of what two and a standard deviation of three, and that will uh, take n here is basically saying the same length as posterior. Mm-hmm. And that's what that does. And then here, in order to get predict get the predictive values, they're basically just taking the um, the intercept from because the posterior distribution. If we go back at the top, has all of these terms from the model. Or we just remember that these were created in order to create uncertainty in this original model. Um. Where are we? 
it shouldn't be messed, it shouldn't be moving up and down so much. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Sorry. Um, so far, uh, I think I'm not sure uh, if uh, he is adding uh, right here, like the growth, like uh, residual on top of other residuals. Because this uh, growth is like uh, the, the, the original uh, thing. And then he had the percentages of more growth. So it's like more can, can be intended as a residuals. I don't know if... <laughs> Okay, maybe not, it's not. Um, so this is the intercept. Um, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I, um, what with this section here? Um, uh, it's definitely, it's not, uh, so it's not the, the error. I mean, mm. can be intended as a residual. No, I'm now adding more things derived by the error, which is the residual. So in in these terms, this can be intended as a another form of residuals. Yeah. You can as, um, like adding uncertainty. Yes. Yeah. And in, in this condition, he has fixed the growth uh, vector with some different values. They are percentages. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, because the, um, the growth they used further up was uh, they used two. So what they're doing here is just basically creating a distribution for the growth on a mean of two. Because when you do linear uncertainty, you do like, you suppose that it's behaving normally. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the, the reason for which he's doing R no, norm. It's okay, building cool. up. Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Okay. Um, wow, imagine if you had lots of, uh, lots of different scenarios you wanted to do. Okay, so and so so by creating so in that case we've now created or he's now created rather the um, the uncertainty in the prediction by using all these other different terms. So he's got the posterior output, then added the uh, the uncertainty. Okay, right. So uh, what's two point six? Oh my god, this takes so long to do this bit. Um, <clears throat> 9.26, simulating uncertainty for linear prediction and new observations. Um, uncertainty for linear predictor. Right, so they create a new model based on, uh, what's it, what, uh, to predict the weight of Weight dependent on earnings. It seems to be. So is he? So is he here? Is predicting weight based on height um, using the earnings data, which seems a bit weird to me. Um, but anyway, oh, and the, the, there's four chains with two thousand iterations per chain. Uh, one one thousand post four four thousand. So that would lead you to have uh, 8,000 samples. Um, and then, so what he do, then does is takes this, um, this earnings data and then height minus 66 for some reason. So the mean. Yeah, I think he's just centering, centering the height value. 
Oh, I mean, it says yes. Yeah, it even says C height. Hmm. Um, so now, then if it then if it's model. on the centered height. All right, so up here is just a normal model. And then after creating this model, we then, wait, what's this called? One. It's exactly the same, but this is on the center distribution. Very specific parameters are basic are the same are exactly the same, are almost exactly the same apart from these two sections here. The insets and this is quite different. Well, the intercepts are certainly different because the insets will have been moved, but the actual population level effects are pretty much the same. So what's the what's the point of that? Um, oh, so if the, the so is this what you're saying here? Is like if the prior distribution, you see both the same windows. Um, it's something to do with um. If the standard error, the prior standard error is 4.1 and the standard error is 2.5. Smaller up here. And it's sm uh. I'm pretty sure that this is to do with page 20, isn't it? Sorry, page 120. We talk about the um, the prior standard error is being 4.1 and the, stand, the data standard error being 2.1. So the data are more informative than the prior and the Bayesian estimate will be closer to the data is what it says here. Yeah, yeah. Is that the election stuff? Sorry, it's 4.1. Or have I moved on too far? Um, yeah. I mean, 9.2. So, yeah. hmm. Back in the 9.2. Uh, sorry, I, I moved ahead too far on the other side. Um, I'm not really certain what this section is showing us. Uh, yep, we have okay, yeah, sorry. Let me look at that as well. Oh, hmm. Stimulating uncertainty. It's basically re it's basically doing the same kind of analysis with different data set. We do the centering as we discussed. Oh, okay. Sorry, it says down here. Since the intercept is difficult to interpret with parameterization, we need to center the predictor. So you can't have a minus predictor, sorry, intercept for a um, for height because it's ridiculous. Um, nobody's minus um, 173 inches or centimeters or whatever they're using there. Right. Um, so that's the whole point of centering it. So he takes the average height away, um, whereas he says up here, uh, I just missed that. I don't know where it is. It's taking 66 away because presumably it's the average which senses it. Oh, there it is. Uh, the intercept are, is now 153 when we take away the intercepts uh, from every single value. Um, if we like a simple, if we'd like a simple point prediction for uh, height, so this is to do a simple point prediction here, 
then a simple point prediction based on a uh, centered height of four whatever above the average, then this is what we'd get. If we then got the linear uh, predictions without the additional error, ter uh, error terms around the beta coefficient, presumably, then we get these values. And then if we do the full uh, prediction with, uh, with error terms, with error, then we have uh, much more variation. Okay, so that, that that that's essentially how we end up with um, with better uh, better uh, resampling, I suppose. Okay, so then it goes on to say um, prior information based models. Classical statistical methods produce summaries and inferences based on a single data set. Bayesian methods combine a model of data with prior information um, with the goal of obtaining inferences that are consistent with both sources of information. Or uh, to go back to what we talked about previously, when you collect a sample, you um, you create a model and it has standard deviations, etc. But when you build a model, you are basically saying in classical statistics, this is exactly as I found it and not accounting for the fact that you might have any error in your sampling. Um, and therefore your, um, your models is kind of set as it were. So you're presuming those have like strong effects. Um, as he goes, you know, this I believe is the Bayesian coefficient, um, which it has on page uh, one nineteen, and what that is is basically saying um, the goal is to uh, combine prior estimate and standard error. It's the probability given the standard error of the prior plus the probability uh, of the standard error of the data um, divided by the probability of the standard error of the prior plus uh, the squared standard error. Am I going down the... Is, um, Steve, did this make any sense to you, the formula? Uh, the formula... Um, maybe it made intuitive sense, I suppose. Um, you know, it kind of leads to what I would expect. Is, it, is, is, is the formula saying it's the squared the squared standard error of the prior. Let me check real quick. I kind of, to be honest, I kind of went off on a weird tangent in the book. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here I am looking. So the formula. Uh, da, 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 da. This form of weighted average of prior and data estimates. The weight proportional to the inverse square of its standard error. Okay. That seemed to make sense. Oh, it's got it here. Yeah. Uh, uh, like in, uh, in a, a Bayesian information aggregation is what it's called. So mm -hmm. what is theta hat? Theta hat, uh, just your parameter, whatever parameter you are looking for. Or your estimate, rather, your estimate of the parameter. Theta is the right. parameter, theta hat's the estimate, Bayesian estimate. Oh, so I misunderstand. I think I misunderstood this. So what it's saying is you take uh, the estimate and then divide it by the standard by the squared standard error of the prior. Right. And then you do that for the actual data, and then you divide those by the probability given the prior plus the probability 
um, of the standard of the squared standard error. Is that right? Right. So it's a weighted average, but it's weighted by the inverse of the square of the standard error. Okay. So the the more uncertainty you have, the less you give it weight then. Oh, I'm sure this is simpler than it looks in my than it seems in my head. Um, well, looking at it as in the LaTeX formulation or in the R formulation, it's not as yeah readable. Yeah. But in the book, it shows the Bayes formula. It's got one over um, one over. I mean, it basically looks the same. Yeah, so saying, let's see, the inverse, the inverse variance is add. So by combining the information, it would lower the, the result, lower your, yeah, your variance, or your standard error, sorry. All right, okay, so give it, right, so giving more information lowers the standard error, okay. mm -hmm. right, and that's what this is essentially saying. So if we were to do this with less samples, then we'd end up with higher standard error. If we uh, did it with more samples, we'd end up with less standard error. Mm -hmm. Right, probably, probably already. And the graph so. is very nice because it, it, it illustrates it. Ah, oh, okay, right. Because yeah. okay. you have your, your typically your flat prior, or not flat, but it's not, yeah, very sharply defined. And then you have the likelihood which is kind of like how you've added definition from your data. And then together, you get the more narrow distribution. Mm -hmm. Which is the posterior, is that, is that correct? Right. So these combine together to get this. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, that's pretty cool. Um, and it's false usually somewhere between the likelihood and the player. Okay. Mm -hmm. it might be, um, I, I, if any of you are kind of struggling with this like me, it might be a good idea to go through this uh, and do each se section of the coding. Uh, yeah, I probably will. Separately. That. You pr nice. Probably just do like even, because I often find building the data database is quite um, useful for me to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather, even, sometimes even graphing is quite struggle with. Um, so what has happened is we have less, uh, we have less certain likelihood as expressed by a larger standard error. Less certain likelihood. Oh right, okay. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we're not we're not at, we're not as certain of the likelihood that we have found the found a good result, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then this is the same kind of thing again. So the posterior again falls between two data points. This is the same thing again, isn't it? It's just different data. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Oh, so this is what we talked about before. So if we were to do um, less. Uh, certain right here. So if we were reducing the standard error, then we'd get um, a wider distribution. Okay, um, so different ways of assigning prior distributions and performing Bayesian calculations. Um, in, in the general example of uh, regression modeling, we must uh, specify prior information on all the coefficients, which in practice often entails weak priors on coefficients for which we have little knowledge or about which we do not uh, make any strong assumptions. Um, we can use um, information to refine estimates from noisy studies. So this is what um, you were talking about a few weeks ago, Steve, where we talked about like how you can use Bayesian uh, analysis in order to improve the strength of uh, weak studies. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh yeah, <laughs> that this a one. funny example, yeah. Yeah. So they, the, so um, if you guys haven't, if you haven't read this, uh, basically, 
um, they did a study which was published in quite a prestigious <laughs> journal to say um, that um, attractive people, um, how have they calculated that, um, are um, more likely to be the parents of females than mm. males. And the way how they, uh, I don't quite know how they categorized that, but uh, they did. It seems um, very subjective, but yeah, they, they, they asked people to look at pictures and decide. <laughs> it was like, a, how many was it? Yeah. Was it like 2,000? Uh, it wasn't, yeah. like, it wasn't necessarily a small sample, which is perhaps why they thought that it was um, perfectly fine. But right. anyway, they got a sample and they found that the, um, the percentage of par- attractive parents who had girls um, when they split it down into binning of parental attractiveness, the parents who were most attractive had um, girls, uh, females, 56% of the time, whereas um, lower down, they were more likely to be around about 50 yeah. or even lower if they were uh, <laughs> uglier. <laughs> Seems like a meme. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you know, that seems like pretty Double harsh. Blind. They didn't let them know what they thought of them. But yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, this is what a strange study. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so what, what does this tell us? Right, um, so more information is available. However, it is well known that the variation in human sex ratio occurs at a very narrow range. For example, a recent study in the United States reported that 48.7% of girls uh, are, 48.7% of the, of of white people are female. 49.2% are uh, female amongst uh, people of of, uh, black race. Um, Which differences of half the pop, uh, similar differences of half a percentage point or less have been found when comparing based on factors such as birth order, uh, marital age, and season of birth. Given that attractiveness itself is only measured subjectively, we'd find it hard to believe that any difference is more or less uh, more or less attractive. Parents could be as much it could be as large as zero point five. Basically, what we're saying is this is a huge uh, a mm-hmm. huge deviation from what we would expect. Right. Based on things that we can quantify, uh, that would be about as high as you could expect to find. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can express our scientific knowledge as a prior distribution on the probability, um, on probability with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0.25. Um, because if 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 the largest we're expecting is 0.5, then that should probably be two standard deviations away, which is why the standard deviation is 0.25. Yeah, the yeah. mean of zero says that before seeing the data, we would have no reason to expect beautiful parents to have elevated or depressed rates of birth uh, of female births. A prior distribution of 0.5 says that we find it highly implausible that the true value of the probability of females is higher than 0.5 or lower than 0.5. Right, so data estimate. On a percentage scale, the survey gives us an estimate of 8%, standard (laughs) error of three. And we can now see that the prior is much more uh, informative than the data. The data, the data standard error is more than 10 times the prior uncertainty. Right, not looking good for the data. Mm. So um, Bayes' estimate, if we use the equations from 9.3.1, express 9.3.1, where was that? Uh, oh, well, we can't see it. Oh, but this is the formulas right at the beginning of the section. So how you would combine them, yeah. The, the yeah. Uh, so the, the, yeah. So that's about yeah combining the likelihood and where is it likelihood right. and the prior information. Do, 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 and where are we? Do, do, do down here. There you are. Yeah. 
if we use the uh, if we use the, uh, um, yeah so there you see yeah if we use the, the ball effect <laughs> yeah we end up with uh, we'll see that the uh, the base is 0 0.06 with a standard error of, about, of 0 0.25. Mm -hmm. um, understanding the uh, base estimate, recalling the total sample size was 3,000, not 2,000, and the purport, uh, proportions all hover around 0 0.5. We can compute the standard error of a proportion near as 0.5 as Oh, I wish it rendered properly. It's really annoying when it doesn't. Yeah, I have to look at the book. Or no. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yeah. So the standard error of the difference between the two groups, each of uh, n equals one thousand five hundred, may be computed with the square of p one uh, one minus p one. Uh, so this is the Bayes estimate uh, given probability, uh, given a situation where. P1, what's, what does this mean, Steve? The, the wavy equal sign? I, I just think it, it goes back to the fact that we would expect P not to deviate from 0.5 very much. Oh, right. Okay. I think that's just what they're saying there, that, that, that they would tend to be in the neighborhood of 0.5. Yeah. So we'd expect it to be, it seems to be like it should be around about 0 0.018. Because the sample size yeah. were not equal in the groups. Oh, yeah. So saying because the sample size were not equal between the different groups, their standard error was a bit large. However, the math shakes out. If you set n equals 300, 10% of 3,000 in the attractive group. Mm -hmm. I can't really remember saying that. The, yeah. The gist of it is, since we're looking for a very, very, very small potential difference, that it, yeah, it would require a much larger sample size to really establish that that was actually there. That's the way I'm reading that. So because we, because we would need a much larger sample size in order to actually verify that effect, right. what we're saying is that effect is most likely to be uh, erroneous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's actually a really interesting section. Wish we do more justice. Um, right. So, um, uniform weekly informative or informative priors. If in Bayesian inference, the uh, likelihood is multiplied by the prior distribution to yield a posterior distribution. Um, so which we take as the summary of our inference given model and data. In this section, we consider a uniform weekly inf a weak information and prior distributions. Um, uniform distribution, uh, it's, it's all about, um, it? you can put a model with uniform priors by setting null. Oh, so the standard is to have null priors. So this would be more like a standard linear model. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So though uh, the BRMS package is generally quite flexible in uh, models pri and priors it supports, this is not fully support for like flat priors in this way. Uh, if you're uh, tricky, you can get close. By default, the priors of class B have flat priors across the real number line. This is essentially uniform infinity um, parameters of class intercept. Parameters of class intercept will not allow for this setting. However, there is a workaround. Recall that one can suppress the default intercept with Y0 syntax. The RMS allows users to then add the intercept back in by naming the next parameter intercept. As in, oh, hmm, okay. this is just telling us how to code it. Um, the, it. The prior of the new intercept will be of class equals B, which can have a default prior, <coughs> just like any of the other priors in class. I mean, it sounds a bit hacky, 
Um, that was very hacky, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's how he did it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Sigma, uh, however, is not as flexible. By default, BRIS sets the lower bound of Sigma at zero. Um, I'm not currently aware of a workaround. I'm also not aware that one can set the upper bound of Sigma to positive infinity. That makes that no sense can... that you would try to do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, you can see, you can see why you can see why yeah. they wouldn't do that. I mean, it's good right. for lear- it's good for learning aids, but I don't think it's yeah, very yeah, useful yeah. Um, when you're actually yeah. trying to model anything. Yeah. Here's how to fit the model in BRMS. Note that because we're using default priors for both incept and growth, there is no need to explicitly state that in the BRM BRM mm. function. Mm-hmm. And then they create the model. Boom. Anyway, the whole point of this is to show that um, <clears throat> the posterior uh, simulations, essentially, which mm-hmm. show the uh, the likelihood, um, they... so what, the greatest likelihood of particular parameters of alpha and beta. Mm-hmm. I swear we did this before. Um, if you, it looks so familiar. Yeah. Anyway, now make the nest two parameters. All right, so, so here we go. So what they're saying here is 95% confidence interval of the parameters, and that's the likelihood. Likelihood is the medium of the 95% co- confidence, uh, uh, confidence interval. <clears throat> and then there's 4,000 posterior draws, which is how you get loads of different outcomes, which is why you can be as far away from the actual true value by... Five points? Three. Yeah, no. something like that. 46 to... Three points, maybe. Three points, yeah. Mm-hmm. Through this section, identify text. I'm going to split this down into four subsections. Oh, God. Right, <clears throat> we'll discuss this. Right, default priors. Uh, let's go and point out defaults. Does anyone else have a hard stop? A little longer. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe it maybe it is better to save this one. It feels like there's yeah a fair bit to unpack. There's there's quite a bit. Yeah, maybe we can save here. this one for next time. Actually, I, I wouldn't say it's particularly well. It's particularly well shown as the other one. I feel like a lot of this is. Building on the same information, yeah. Although, um, a lot of it's just about uncertainty and parameters, but building all the but kind of get you to think about the uncertainty in the um, in the different uh, coefficients, essentially. Yeah. So that really what it is uh, what was chapter prediction and in Bayesian inference. So it is about that. Um, and then trying to tell you to make sure that when you get a effect, have a look to see whether that effect is truly what you would expect. Because if it's not what you truly expect, you can then say, well, if the um, effect in the data is smaller than, uh, sorry, much larger than what we would expect to see in the, um, with the taking account of the parameters that we've simulated, then we can say that actually the data is probably not representative and not a good model despite the data we collected. Uh, and the rest of that goes into this in a bit more detail. Yeah, shall we stop, shall we stop there? Um, I think I think it makes sense probably because it is a pretty substantial section. Yeah, we can pick it up. Is it everybody else is good with that? that yes, it's good. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to to go more in detail about the stand model. Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, what's the next one? The next one's uh, the next chapter is more about uh, multiple. Um, what happens when you've got multiple predictors in there? Mm. which I presume will uh, be building on this. And then um, assumptions, diagnostics, and evaluation.
Okay. Okay. Uh, so I suppose we should leave it there. Um, did anyone else have any thoughts about anything we went over today? Well, I see. I just you know, uh, there's quite mm, lots of thing to to see. So we'll see next time if there's more. The, just the the results is very low. Zero point, no point, mm. no six percent. So zero. Very low. I don't know. Sorry. I think I missed that. I said the the, the result is very low, uh, no point no six percent. Oh yeah, yeah, it's it's very low, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Hmm. So on the on the attractiveness one. It's so nice, quite much must be, I don't know, like something very sensible. Um, so but very, I don't know, it's very little, little difference. Uh, mm. Not sure about that. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, Yeah, I'm not certain. <laughs> I suppose it's the best thing about Bayesian analysis, isn't it? <laughs> you don't want to be it, certain. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it, I don't know. You can get people arguing about, yeah, whether your prior is valid or not, things like that. I feel like mm. they, made, they made a pretty good justification of their prior, though. Yeah. I, I, they, I mean, they only used really a small example there, and they used very much a United States example, didn't they? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, you know, I suppose pretty big samples to choose from because it's about two, 250 million, 300 million? 300 million, something like that. The country. <clears throat> right anyway um uh, yeah okay uh, i was gonna say what i'll do is i'll re-familiarize myself with the chapter when we get back to it next week but um if anyone else wants to take a crack at it uh you know feel free um you're more than welcome um you know rather than just listening to me stumble through it i'll try to yeah as well kind of go through the uh the as kurt stuff before we actually meet just to I, I feel like I wasn't maybe super prepared for this one, so I'll try to do a little better job next time. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I, I think it, it doesn't, like, uh, I think perhaps what didn't help was the fact we had quite a big gap in between. So uh, if you yeah. read it like a while ago, you'll have forgotten a lot of it. If you're anything like me. That, that, that was the case as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just p uh, put it on my calendar and be sure to uh, give it a look before then. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we could do that, move on to linear predictors, and then, uh, what's it, chapter 11 is assumptions, diagnosis, diagnostics, and model evaluation. Mm -hmm. So that's more about validity, I suppose, of your models. Um, yeah. Wow, this book, this is taking a really long time. <laughs> I suppose it's a whole different way of thinking compared to what you usually do. Right. Mm. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave it there for today, guys. Um, well, I'm glad. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> glad everyone's back. Have a good week. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, speak to you soon, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.